there she be. What are we looking at? This is a top head block for a V8 for a Wright Brothers airplane. First time since how long? <laughs> 1910. Since 1910. And the only one in existence. That's good. It's historical. It sure is. <laughs> and t tell me who you are. Bob Egan. Egan? Egan, yep. That, that's a good name. <laughs> <laughs> and there's old Greg Cone standing there. He gonna, he's going to mail that out, isn't he? Make well, it. He's got a whole lot of machining to get stuck yeah. in this thing. So How many castings you got to make? Right now we're just making this one because it's a prototype. How many they ever do in the future? I have no idea. Maybe never. Another one. Who there's more than one casting involved, is it not? To make the whole motor, yeah. There's a smaller, lower cast part that we already did a week ago. Could you uh, point to parts of it and name it for me? Tell me what I'm That's looking at. That's up to at. him. <laughs> I'm starting at the front. Well, it's upside down. There we go. There we go. Sound effects. Yeah. Main bearing locations. I It'll can't keep up with you. <laughs> well, catch up. Main bearing bores right here. Okay. This will be the camshaft location. Five of them. And this you are reverse engineering this engine. Yeah. And you had what to start with? Uh, drawing of the camshaft and some photos. Okay. And where'd you get the photos? Uh, some came from Dayton, from the right state, in their collection. Okay. So you don't do too many of these, do you, Mr. Egan? Mm, this is the first one of this particular one, but we've done, what, three of the... Four cylinders? Yeah, four cylinders. There's a four-cylinder model, which were the first ones. One was for the... The first one we did, was that the 1903 or was that 1905? Um, 1903. 1903 was the first one. And then we did two more. And you've done some vertical force. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those are the four cylinders. But this is the first ever V8 that we ever did. How long has this uh, shop been here? Do you know? Uh, it's been in this building since 1942. And the business started in 1935, a few blocks away from here. That's when I started, 1935. Really? <laughs> yeah, my grandfather and his brother started the business in 1935 and uh, moved here in 1942 and been here ever since. Family business. Remember all those little things you were asking about? Mm-hmm. Okay, this is the pattern that was used to make that casting. Um, this was made in Ohio, wasn't it? Illinois. Illinois? Illinois. And so the pattern's made in two halves. And they go together like this. And in the in the mold, it's cast in this fashion. This is your bottom half of the casting, this is your top half. All this coming out here, and all this out here is where you set hard sand cores down in that mold that you make off of these halves. And in order to make those hard sand cores, you have to have core boxes. That's what these are. These are little half boxes. Two halves go together to make a little round core that fits in this location. And then two halves of this paste together to go in this location. And what that does is it makes the holes come through the end of the casting, which you can see over there. Then, to make those inside hollow sections, you've got two more core boxes, which these get packed full of sand, struck off level, gassed hard, so that we can take them out of there. And then, it was six of these and two of the other. Right. Yeah, six of this one half, two of the other. The two went on either end and the other six light up on the inside. So it's like putting a jigsaw puzzle together. Once you make all these pieces, you have your mold made, then you have to take all these pieces and set them down in that mold 
so that they exactly set perfect so that when you close the whole mold up and you pour the metal in you get the interior to come out the way that came out over there. So you got two different core boxes here and then there's a lot of little loose parts that you have to use to make for instance like these pads that are on the end out here and here. And so all these all these little pieces all have to go together like a certain fashion because if they don't go in there then they're not going to make the casting the way it's supposed to turn out. So that is pretty much what we do as far as getting the casting made and the parts all done. So in a foundry you never you you never say all oh, shucks like <laughs> Greg does. No, we do something worse than that. <laughs> Like a fudge. <laughs> oh, fudge. Oh, fudge. Wow. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Now, these are all castings. This is actually pin and stuff. This will get remelted over. Here. Now, these are castings that we made for customers. They're decorative reproduction parts for uh, a fence around a historic building. I don't know what building. But these are all castings. Wow. Interesting. Using original pieces to copy to make parts that are missing off a fence section. Around a, maybe a cemetery or Could something? Could be a cemetery, church, I'm assuming, or something yeah, yeah. of that nature. Yeah. The um, metal, different alloys, or is it pretty constant? No, different. We do uh, two types of aluminum and uh, about four different types of bronze and brass. You do bronze and brass, mm -hmm. okay. So so you make plaques and things like that? Oh yeah. Red brass. Okay. And ingot probably weighs around 35 pounds. So this is what we use to melt up to make our bronze parts for people. Okay. So, and when we buy it, that's how we buy it. Now, okay, go ahead. So these are furnaces. They're called floor, floor stationary furnaces. And... Um, What's sitting down inside of it, you can look in there, is a crucible or a pot. And crucible? And it, the pot is a crucible, it's made out of silicon carbide. They're like a ceramic. They're fired and they're uh, very strong. Um, then what we do is we set the pot down in the furnace, put some charged material metal down in there, and then we light up the furnace. It's an oil-fired furnace. And uh, once we get the flame going on it, then we close the lid, and then the metal we're going to melt into that pot, we set up on the top of the lid, and we close it. Close it like this. So your metal goes up over that hole. Right, so we put the metal up here, and while it's melting, we keep feeding the metal into that pot down through that hole until it's full. Okay. And then, then the key to making castings is knowing the temperature of that metal because it has to be a certain temperature for different types of jobs. For instance, if it's a very, very thin casting, the metal has to stay liquid a long time to fill a cavity in a mold, so you have to have the temperature hotter. If it's something that's a big, heavy chunk of metal, then you can keep the temperature down lower. So you never pour a big chunk hot, hot, and you never pour a thin part cold. It's a question of knowing what temperature and how we can tell is we have gauges which are called pyrometers and we take you said what we, did we call them a pyrometer pyrometer a pyrometer and you'll stick that tip down into the molten metal and on this gauge it'll read the temperature whatever that liquid is is melted in there and when you get it to the temperature you need it then you take this you take it out you shut your furnace off turn off the the blower, turn off the oil, and then we take these tongs. We use these to go down into the furnace around the pot, we clamp it, we pull it up. Oh, That's how we lift the pots out. And we bring the pots over and we put it in this cradle over here. There, I see the cradle. And then we can roll it out to where, at that point, we can pick it up with another chain. 
you have a, a circuit like this. And then a, another chain system, you pick this up and then we can move the pot of metal up and down the racks to pour all the molds that we're pouring off. Uh, roughly how much time do you have to work with it before you got to go back to the crucible? From the time that pot comes out until the time you're finished pouring probably only takes maybe five minutes. And after that, as, as soon as that furnace turns off and you get the pot out of that atmosphere of that furnace, the temperature is gradually ticking colder, colder, colder. So you only have a short workability time to get your pot out, get it up the rack, pour what you're pouring, and be done. And like I said, within five minutes, ten tops, you're done pouring off a rack of molds. Then they have to sit, because they're molten, they're liquid, for another 10, 15 minutes. Before then, you can dump the mold out, which breaks up your mold you made in sand, but out comes your casting that you need. And then from that, it goes over to the other side of the shop, where then we take and cut off the gates of the risers, clean it up, grind it, ready to ship it. And then all the parts of metal that are attached onto a casting, for instance, this is a end gate, and this is a riser that would have been attached to a casting, when they get cut off, they keep segregated so we know which metal it was. That can be remelted over again. So we can use gets it again. Recycled over again. Okay. And Even they, if you have a bad casting that's no good, you can melt it up, start from scratch. And this must be a ladle. These are hand ladles for doing like, sometimes we have to, what they call double pour casting. If it's a real thin part, We'll have the pot pouring in one spot and somebody with some metal dumping into another spot into the same mold so that the metal flows through fast enough to fill that void that's inside that cavity of the mold. So there's all kinds of little things that you have to do to be able to make castings. And every job presents different challenges. A little science and a little art? A um, lot of science, yeah, obviously. and. Uh, in a lot of cases, a lot of artistic, <laughs> you know, creativity. Experience is another way of saying it, I right. suppose. Right, absolutely, yeah.